Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Philippon, Serino, and uh, John, and Smith and Nephew for the invitation to be here again. Uh, this is the marquee talk for hip arthroscopy, and uh, uh, for me, it's a great compliment to be able to be a part of it again, so I'm very grateful. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, is um, uh, techniques for our allograft labor reconstruction of the hip. Uh, my relationships have no bearing on the content of this talk. Uh, this is a situation that we get into uh, quite frequently with hip arthroscopy. I always say hip arthroscopy is like Pandora's box. You're never quite sure what you're going to get into until you're there. In this situation, it's a 50-year-old who's got a healthy joint, but really a miserable labrum. It's about three times the normal size, injected, hypertrophic, uh, and with intrasubsystic degeneration. So the question, what would you do in this situation? Um, I think in, in this situation, you know, you've got a relatively low chance of getting that labrum to be fully successfully integrated and healed. I think the labor reconstruction should be something that we consider uh, uh, in these more advanced situations. I think it really represents an ideal solution because if you think about it, the patient comes in to see us for one reason or one reason alone. It's not because they have impingement, dysplasia, it's because they have pain. And when we remove the painful labral tissue, that in and of itself is helpful. As we saw in Dr. Bird's debridement studies, those patients are our longest followed and have done very well. The nice thing about the graft is that the graft will always be a neural, and it should never really be able to perceive pain. We want a nice callus graft that's not going to be able to feel that. We see that with ACLs. We'd love for them to have proprioceptive uh, uh, sensation, but they don't. And so I think we just exploit that in this situation. My grafts have gotten longer. My grafts now are 9 to 12 centimeters, so we're replacing more of the abnormal labral tissue. And as we're reproducing more normal anatomy and biomechanics, I think that's why we're seeing the favorable results. I think the main advantage here um, uh, in, in, in this situation, if you try and preserve your labrum in a situation where you have a lateral center edge angle of 50 or these really ridiculous pincers that Dr. Bird was talking about, it's very hard to conserve that tissue and really adequately get the rim back to what you want it to be. And so in this situation, it's easier just to remove the labrum, make the cup what you want it to be, get these drastic corrections from, from 50 down to 32, uh, and then make a new labrum for your new cup. Our database performed over 1,300 labor reconstructions now. You can see in all of our metrics nice uh, uh, improvements in the Harris HIP score, look, Shemini functional score, VA score, and satisfied patients. The key when you look at some of the sub areas within my uh, uh, database, you can see that primary reconstructions outperform the other groups. They do better than the revisions do, and that makes sense. Our first surgery really is our best opportunity to get somebody perfect. Uh, and when you compare them to re labor repairs in my hands, Yes, the labor repairs are doing well, but the reconstructions are outperforming that. Uh, this is our paper. Uh, it has been published. It is in the Journal of Arthroscopy now. Um, it is allograft use in uh, arthroscopic labor reconstruction of the hip with a minimum of two-year follow-up describing the front-to-back technique. In it, we had 114 patients. Uh, the age range, average age, was about 39 years old. I had 88 primary procedures and 36 revision procedures. So I would say that pretty challenging cohort of patients to get well. When you looked at our results, we look at all the metrics, we can see statistically significant improvements in all areas. Modified Harris HIP score, luxury functional score, VAS score, final level of satisfaction was 8.7. But the thing that I like about this study and, and this cohort of patients is that a 33-point improvement in the Harris HIP score, the vast majority of our HIP studies, typically it's somewhere in the mid-20s. And so I think this is a little bit better. This is what I've seen in my personal practice and why it's a part of my practice. But I think that we should be considering it more and more liberally as well. Also, that final Harris HIP score of 87, uh, by definition for the Harris HIP score, is an excellent result. So the value of this paper, uh, it certainly shows that labral reconstructions offer a significant benefit to patients. This represents the largest cohort of labral reconstructions that's been described in the literature to date. It validates use of allograft for those that want to use it. Uh, and it's the first description of the front to back technique. Now, as we're talking more about techniques, usually I've just been describing allograft labral reconstruction. I want to go through the steps. I cannot reiterate enough. This is a procedure that is very hard. This is a procedure that you have to follow the steps perfectly. You have to execute at every level before you get to the labor reconstruction perfectly or else those steps will hurt you later. That begins with your exposure. That 
It begins with preserving your capsule. You cannot remove your capsule counterintuitively. You need your capsule to be able to do this procedure. You have to perfect your FAI work, especially that on the acetabular rim. Your rim needs to be perfect to be able to put anchors in and get graft down. Preparing the graft, a lot of people want to do it fast. It cannot be done fast. In every other situation, in every other joint, when we do a reconstruction procedure, we're simply pulling a graft across the joint and docking it on either side. We're not working with it. When you work with the graft inside of the joint, it's going to fray, it's going to wear. You have to have something that's durable, and that begins with meticulous preparation. Placing your anchors, you have to get them in the perfect place because this graft is going to be very sensitive to eversion. So you have to put your anchors in the right place. Then you have to know how to tension it and ultimately fix it. Honestly, I go to talks and I hear people talk about how maybe it's not important to do a camera section or pin service section. The whole reason why we got to this position is because the machine was bad. We really need to get perfect at getting our bony work done right, done properly, so that that machine moving forward works well so that we can protect our soft tissue work. Techniques that are out there, uh, the most conventional one and widely used is, is to fix it in the front, then fix it in the back, and then fix it in between. This has the advantage that I think is technically is much simpler. Because once you fix it in the front and the back, and fixing it in the back is a little bit more challenging, but once that's done, it's just a large labor repair. The disadvantage to this that I had with my personal practice was that as my graphs were getting longer, it's harder to measure and create the perfect length of graph that you need. And so if I ended up in a situation where the graph was too short or a little bit too long, it was challenging to fix or get a seal with a femoral head. So that's how I developed the front to back technique. We basically fix it from the front to the back and then cut it in situ so our graft length is perfect every time and we can get a seal every time. Because if you don't get a seal with your graft and the femoral head, you're only making yourself feel better that you did a labral reconstruction because functionally it's probably not going to be helpful. You do need to have a third portal for this. And so when you look at the portals, I use the standard anterior medial portal, maybe shift it up just a little bit more proximally than most anterior lateral portal, and then I use a distal portal. Uh, the anterior medial portal is helpful because I use this to tension the graft as I fix it. The distal portal is helpful because that's how I get low. Everybody wants to know, how do I get low on the cup? It's that portal. Okay? I put my anchors in from there and I do all of my knot tying from there. And my anterior lateral portal is important for cutting the graft. So when you look at anchor placement, it's important to know where you're trying to put these anchors. So this is a right hip, okay, 12 o'clock position, my drawing of the transverse acetabular ligament. And you can see the most bottom part of the cup is actually wide. It's pretty easy to get an anchor in. The only problem is because it's not weighted. Sometimes it's a little bit soft. So sometimes you need to under drill for your anchor to get it to stick. This right here represents the iliopsoas fossa. Right before the iliopsoas fossa is a really nice place to put an anchor. And then right above it, you typically skip this thin zone and put another one right here. The only thing you have to be concerned about, and I think that this is real and I probably have created this problem in a few patients, is that if you use a hard anchor or a peak anchor in this location, you may breach the iliopsoas fossa on the far cortex and you may irritate the psoas as a consequence. So those are all suture anchors for me. This is my keystone anchor right here at the fourth position. That's where the graft transitions from vertical to horizontal. So you really have to get this in the right location. These anchors are pretty easy. As you get down the back, it gets pretty thin, a little bit more challenging. So you need to have different guides. You need to have different anchors. You need to figure out what it takes you to get to these zones. Goals of the prepared graft, I can't emphasize enough. Spend the time, get your graft perfect. Get a good assistant or do it yourself. If you don't do it well, it's going to hurt you later, I promise. Working on the size, what's the perfect size? Well, if you're a small graft, right, our goal is to get a graft that's going to incorporate into the body and form a seal with the femoral head. Well, if you're a small graft, you're going to be able to compress it very easily, okay, but your seal is going to be a little bit more challenging. If you're a big graft, it's easy to get a seal because it's a big piece of sausage in there, but it's hard to compress it to the point where it's going to heal. Optimal size for me is about five to six millimeters. This is the technique. We prepared the acetabular rim. I place all of my anchors in the beginning because I have the best exposure. Suture management is not that challenging, but in the beginning, uh, it takes a little bit. I use the most anterior inferior anchor then, secure it to the graft, and pull the graft into the joint. I then provisionally fix it, and then fix it from front to back. I'm looking upside down now. I tension the graft. I then cut it at the perfect length so that we have the perfect length graft. I then use a double loaded suture in the back, which is kind of like a rip stop. One goes through the graft at the end, and then the circumferential suture then cannot cut out. And that's the best way I figured out over the years to fix the end of your graft. Here's your final labor reconstruction. This is about nine and a half centimeters, healthy looking joint, view down the back of the joint. 
We then reduce uh, the traction or reduce the joint. You can see the graft get nicely compressed and you can see that we've created that perfect seal. And you can see there's your final labor reconstruction. Now, this is a fast video. This oversimplifies the case. I frequently am bombarded between talks um, uh, about how do I get low. So I broke down the video with this and you can see this is how we get low. You preserve the capsule, okay, can you, so you can see the needle coming from the distal portal. Now I'm coming through the bottom part of the capsule with the needle and I use that then and dilate it up. Just a switch stick and then I actually use the um, obturator for the cannula. Then I put my drill guide and you can see we get all the way down to the bottom of the joint now. It's actually pretty easy, okay? But the key for this, you have to have the capsule intact, you have to have the psoas intact because you're coming from the skin around the femoral head into the joint it's going to want to push you out anterior to the joint. If you don't have capsule or psoas there, you've got no hope of holding that position, okay? The next question I get is how do I get the graft into the joint? So what we do is we basically take the most anterior inferior suture, we pass it through the graft, tie a knot, pass it through again, then we use our post suture to pull the graft into the joint. So I'm not tying knots and pushing it, I'm simply using it as a pulley to pull it in. Look at how easily it comes in now. And now you just push the rest in. Okay? But you have to be able to get a cannula to stick down there again. Intact capsule is the key. Next question I frequently get is how do you cut it? This is actually a massively oversimplified step that everybody thinks should be easy but when you actually put it in practice it's very hard. Okay? So the way we do that, we tension our graft. Okay? I pull it across. I want to see it pulled across such that I can see the holes right there. Oh, I missed it. But you pull it right there to the point where you see it kind of pulled in a little bit. Then I basically am pulling um, from the, actually, you know, I'm going to start this over because I just want to, I can't back up. Can you just back up the slide to start it one more time? Because I, I want to show this step really nicely. So I'm pulling from the anterior lateral portal, okay, with my grasper, okay. I get my tension right. I just pull it off the rim a little bit. Then what I do is I switch portals with my grasper. My grasper now comes from the distal portal and I cut from my anterior lateral portal. And that's how it's cut. You have to have tension on the graft, otherwise you can't cut it. You can't really shave it. You can't really burn it. Beaver blade works the best. The key is you don't want to cut into the muscle. If you cut into the muscle, basically it's like cutting into the deltoid in a rotator cuff repair. Everything just starts to swell and it becomes very challenging. Pearls and pitfalls, I can't emphasize enough. This has an incredible learning curve to it. Um, uh, done done well, it's, a, it's, a, it's changed my life. It's a great procedure, okay? So if you're going to do it, the decision to do so has to be done with great respect. The optimal graft size for me is about five to six millimeters in diameter. Really spend the time to make the graft perfect. Make your FAI work perfect. That should be all of our goals. Our x-rays should look like we haven't been there and it should look like a normal joint. The anchor position, you will evert your graft 100% of the time if your graft or if your anchors are not in a perfect place. For me, my evolution over the last five or six years has been towards longer grafts. I found that residual labral tissue is a problem. There's a big trend now moving towards segmental grafts. That's fine if that's a step stone for you to move forward. I've learned that segmental grafts create a problem because residual labral tissue has lost its hoop fibers and can be a pain generator later. I've had to revise a lot of those early labral reconstructions because of that. So if you're interested in making this a part of your practice, uh, please come visit. I'm happy to help you through the learning curve. Uh, I'd also like to thank Joint Media Solutions for video editing. Uh, if you uh, need to augment your uh, website or uh, your talks, please uh, consider using them. Thank you very much.